Welcome to Sweet Valley Diaries, the podcast where, apparently, the singular linchpin holding the entirety of the universe together and keeping everything from devolving into chaos is whether or not these two identical twins still look the same. Book 32, The New Jessica. Elizabeth's twin has become a complete stranger. So does that mean me, Miss America? Hi, welcome to Sweet Valley Diaries. I, of course, am your host, Marissa Flaxbart, and I'm here today with Caitlin McCann. Hello. Hi. Well, hello again, I should say. Hello again, because this is not your first trip around the old Sweet Valley Diaries microphone. <laughs> I wanted to say it's not my first like rodeo drive, but they're not in they're not in California. Oh no, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's so good. Don't apologize for that one. Um Caitlin was one of the very first guests of Sweet Valley Diaries, book number three, playing with fire. Still up on the shelves. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that's where that went. Yeah. Playing with Fire was about Bruce Patman. Mm-hmm. This book uh features very few boys at all. Which for Sweet Valley High is kind of shocking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So sorry, everybody. I don't think you're going to get to hear the uh, Jocelyn's uh, boys theme song this week. We don't really have too many boys to talk about. But we can talk about the cover yes. of this book. If there's ever been a Sweet Valley yeah. book that needs the cover discussed, it is the new <laughs> Jessica book 32. I I just love that Elizabeth looks very much like a shocked mom, you know, yeah. like, Heavens to Betsy is what that face says. It, you know, like, it's, yeah. it's the, the pantomime of shock. It is. <laughs> right. Elizabeth and Jessica, uh, we know it's Jessica, uh, are standing back to back. Jessica looks, I mean, Jessica throughout the new Jessica is described as looking very beautiful and glamorous, and her look is really working. Um, the new Jessica, you guys, is new because of a makeover. We'll get into it, but stick with us for the time being. Jessica on the cover of this book, I think she looks like she's in drag. Is it just me? I I think she looks like a very handsome man who is also rather short, who is in 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 drag. You know, I, I didn't see it before. But now when you say that I'm having a really hard time unseeing it. Uh, like it was as you were saying that I feel like my image of her morphed. <laughs> <laughs> like I can think of some boys I went to high school with that kind of look like Jessica looks on the cover of this mm-hmm. of this book. And yeah, Elizabeth, on the contrary, looks as good as she's ever looked on the cover of any of these books. Not not just because she's making this cute, oh my god, what the hell face, but she's got a cute outfit on. Um yeah, it's Elizabeth at her most together, yet most upset. How much fun would this have been if it had been a Sweet Valley High novel about a high school boy that started dressing in drag? I mean, I would read that book. Yeah. I feel like, actually, that is more on the pulse of what current YA is doing. I mean, have you read the, um, uh, what, it's the, oh, The Prince and the Dressmaker. I it's have a not. graphic novel um, that's not necessarily teen-focused, but it is, like, the main characters are young people. Uh, and it's a prince who's like, has a secret life as a drag performer, and his best friend becomes, or is his seamstress. <laughs> well, I haven't read that book, and I haven't read too much non-Sweet Valley YA, but I will say that the last three YA novels that I've read have all been um, about... Uh, two teenage boys in love or 20 something boys in love Perfect. so that's been uh, my that's like what YA is to me yeah uh, from I, I'm not reading the fantasy stuff oh no wait one of them was kind of a fantasy thing no I'm with you YA needs more drag let's have it come all on, right YA, come on YA writers out there help us out <laughs> yeah. um, an impassioned plea yeah. from two <laughs> lovers of both drag Caitlin and I at one point were known to famous drag queen Morgan McMichaels <laughs> as girls that she could say, oh, hi, it's good to see you, too. Uh, I don't think there were names involved, but oh, hi, it's good to see you is definitely part We were recognized on site by Morgan McMichaels. Like, I'll take that to my grave. <laughs> uh, because we used to go to a drag bingo night that um, that she hosted. And also lovers of romances, mm-hmm. romance novels. Yeah. 
<laughs> Lovers of Romance is, I guess, is something else. Although those are great, too, just in general. Oh, yeah. I grew up reading romance novels probably around the same time that you started getting invested in Sweet Valley High novels, to be honest <laughs> with you. But I feel like that is part of what is so interesting about reading these books now is while I didn't read these growing up, there's that part of me that started reading those books for, you know, the drama or the love of love. Yeah. And there's there's so much of that young earnestness in the Sweet Valley High novels. Oh, yeah. You know, and so it makes sense. It makes sense why they were so popular and why there's still something that even as a non-teen reader, <laughs> you, you your heart kind of feels for these characters. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we could so easily like go down the rabbit hole of only having this conversation, which would be amazing. <laughs> and gladiators, maybe you would be super into that. But I do think that it is the purview of this podcast to recap the book at hand. So let's talk about the new Jessica, because there certainly is um, things to talk about. In book number 31, Taking Sides, we got a sense that Jessica was starting to get fed up with being mistaken for Elizabeth. And that continues in the outset of this book. Mm -hmm. The very first thing that happens in the book is that Jessica cleverly tricks Elizabeth into loaning her like a peach colored dress mm -hmm. that's like brand new. Yeah, this peach colored dress that was sent by the Wakefield twins grandparents and Jessica gets her paws on it and wears it to school and everybody compares her to Elizabeth. And when she gets flustered on that comparison, well, they, they mistake her for Elizabeth. Yeah. And when when they get when she gets flustered by it, everybody just says, "But you're wearing Elizabeth's clothes." <laughs> right, right. Jessica at one point is reminded that Elizabeth wore the same dress last week, mm -hmm. and she's like, "Curses! Why did I not remember that Elizabeth has already worn this?" Um, but she's she's both wrong because come on, like she comes in. What is she? What was her original scheme when she went into Jessica goes into Elizabeth's room with the line that what she's trying to do is like change dinner shifts with mm -hmm. Elizabeth, but knowing that Elizabeth will refuse because she's asked for this too many times. So then she asks to borrow the dress. No. And we, then we get a glimpse into Jessica's head, realizing that this was her plan, all, her fiendish all plan all along. Yeah. Well, and then like Elizabeth's going to say no. So the dress will be a consolation prize. Mm, and for Jessica, this comparison and this like faux pas of being seen in Elizabeth's clothes also ties to her like long standing rivalry with Lila Fowler, who it's been dropped early, early on in the book that like Lila's dad just came back from Paris and has a whole new wardrobe. And the whole reason for Jessica wanting to borrow Elizabeth's dress is so that she can have something new to wear and com continue her high level competition with Lila Fowler. And so she feels thwarted not only because she looks like her sister, but because she's been caught wearing something that somebody else has already worn around school. That is a good point. Um, I have a passage here on page 15 about this. She had been expecting everyone to think she looked perfectly fantastic. Instead, the very worst thing in the entire world had happened, even worse than being ignored. Everyone had mistaken her for Elizabeth. It had happened all day long. First, Mr. Collins had practically knocked her over in the hall with a pile of papers he had for the Oracle. Under ordinary circumstances, Jessica liked Mr. Collins, the strawberry blonde English teacher who worked as an advisor for the school paper. But not that day. Jessica had given him a frosty look. I'm afraid you have the wrong Wakefield, she had informed him with just the slightest touch of asperity in her voice. Oh, sorry, Jess, Mr. Collins said, his brow wrinkling in confusion. I know what it is. He exclaimed, finally, it's the dress. Wasn't Elizabeth wearing it last week? Um, so that's a, also a backdoor Collins watch, 2019 still. Yeah, no, I get that because I feel like Mr. Collins, for me, so many times, I was like, am I supposed to have some thirst for this man? <laughs> <laughs> like, because it feels very much like the narrator does. <laughs> like, Is this your first taste of Mr. Collins? Did you get any Mr. Collins mm. in uh, Playing With Fire? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Collins, I didn't really have a, a Collins watch planned for this episode because Mr. Collins appears a lot in this book, but he, that is as like sexed up as he gets. Like strawberry blonde English teacher. Normally, Jessica wouldn't mind talking to him, but but uh, but yeah, um, I just I thought it was funny that Jessica thought that being mistaken for Elizabeth was even worse than being ignored. Mm. Well, there is one moment later on in the book, if we're talking about Mr. Collins' watch, like there's a moment when um, Elizabeth misplaces her diary, 
where he is helping Elizabeth try to find it again. And he like gently puts his hand on her hand. And it was just kind of one of those moments where I'm like, why are we discussing this? <laughs> like, am I supposed to read something into that? Or is this just like a time warp where that's really just like a, a nice thing? Like that's just a nice gentle touch and it's not, I'm not supposed to read anything into it. Maybe it's because I come from Romance Landia where like there are no subtle touches. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. You know, like everybody's touching with that's, intent. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's not the worst thing that happens. The worst thing that happens is when Jeffrey French, who is Elizabeth's brand spanking new boyfriend, mm. um, thinks that she's Elizabeth, also because of the dress. And I have a passage here, too. No sooner had she sat down at Jeffrey's table than he had put his hand on her arm very affectionately and had started to discuss his plans for the weekend. Jessica had just stared for a minute before realizing that he had made a mistake. Jeffrey, I'm Jessica, she had pointed out. Jeffrey jumped back as if he'd been stung. He turned bright red and kept muttering how sorry he was. And from the downcast expression on his face, it appeared he was disappointed as well. As far as Jessica was concerned, it was bad enough being mistaken for her twin sister. But realizing that people were disappointed to discover she wasn't Elizabeth was a million times worse. So anyway, things are going from bad to worse to a million times worse for mm-hmm. Jessica. Which is really all it takes for her to develop a scheme. The plan. Well, and then there's a whole section where she's at the mall, I think, with... Um, I think it's Lila and maybe Caroline. Maybe I might be getting the third friend. Probably Kara. Kara? Kara. Okay. Um, So they're at the mall and she's telling them about this article that she's read. And she's like, I think I'm having an identity crisis. Uh, And (laughs) they are kind of politely and like in a good friend sort of way being like, I don't think that's what's happening here. <laughs> Isn't this just like Hallmark Jessica going a little overboard? And she's just like, no, it's an identity crisis. This happens to people all the time. Yeah, Jessica is this person in this book throughout that's like, you know what I just read on the internet? Yeah. Like, I just read a very interesting article um, on Goop about how twins sometimes have a complex where they're too similar and eventually they have a schism and, and, and they just, they can't be friends anymore. Or whatever nonsense she's saying or like, it's a real problem. Like, I read about this. It's a real problem, you guys. Um, yeah. So, and I, it's from chapter one, but I do have a passage that I highlighted please. Ooh, where, please. Um, you know, she talks about Ingenue Magazine, which does come up later in the book. But she, uh, she says, the article was on identity crisis. Don't you realize that's exactly what's happening to me? I'm losing myself. Do you realize, she added tragically, waving her spoon around for added emphasis, that I don't have a single thing that belongs just to me. Think about it. Who does the fiat belong to? Supposedly both you guys, Lila said dryly, but you seem to use it about ten times as much as Liz. Jessica took another bite of ice cream. Both of us, she said injured. That's exactly right, Lila. And what about doing stuff around the house? I bet you and your little brother used to do different chores. And she kind of goes on and builds from there about how, like, they have to share chores. They don't even have separate chores. Oh, the humanity. It's Meanwhile, Jessica has an entire bedroom full of things that belong only to her, but nobody brings that up. And she is the one who's always borrowing Elizabeth's clothes constantly. But... Um, Lila and Jessica, early on, find themselves at a place that I don't think we've ever seen mentioned before called, what's the department store called? It's called Litton and Brown. Yeah, Litton right? and Brown, I think. Litton and Brown, which I'm excited that there's like a new store in town. It's a department <laughs> store. Um, oh, by the by, Jessica does have a moment's passing remembrance of the last time that she felt sort of like an outcast in her family. And she mentions the name of Nikki Shepard, who's a boy who like ran off to San Francisco, and she was going to go with him, but we haven't heard from him since. So I found myself wondering when I was writing the haikus that I wrote about the, the various books, like, I wonder what ever happened to Nikki. Like, I hope he's okay in San Francisco. Like, a 17-year-old boy takes a bus by himself to San Francisco in the 80s. Like, a lot of things could happen. Um, I mean, now a lot of things could happen. Yeah. But at any rate, Litton and Brown, and she sees a sign about makeovers, and that's the mm-hmm. sort of, uh, the MacGuffin here is the sign. Then then she goes over to Lila's and plans this whole makeover um, sleepover, mm-hmm. um, where she basically just opens a magazine and there's like a beautiful Eastern European 
woman. Mm-hmm. Her name is like Katerina. Yeah, I think I think she uh, she also throughout the book kind of invokes the name Brooke Shields as well as like yeah. the ideal model, but then she's also looking towards this fictional model that you know isn't based on on reality and she does have those kind of like european looks and she's sultry and mysterious and those are kind of the buzzwords that jessica clings to when she's trying to figure out what the new her is going to look like right so she decides that she's going to wear these like exotic clothes she's going to to change her makeup like lila goes to the silver door salon which we have heard mentioned before in the series Lynn Henry's mother went to the Silver Door and tried to take her there. Or I think it was like the manager or something of the Silver Door, which I feel like is how you have to say that. Um, and Lila learned from George at the Silver Door new makeup tips. So she's going to show Jessica how to put blush higher on her cheekbones and put on coal. They talked about black coal mm-hmm. eyeliner a lot. But we're bearing the lead, of course, because yeah. the big change... <laughs> That Jessica makes is, of course, is of to course. the hair. Yeah, she goes from being the sunny Wakefield blonde, you know, kind of the all-American girl, to dark raven hair. And she, I think, cuts it a little bit as well, or, like, maybe does some stuff with fringe they on the They talk about how she kind of has curls, which I think mm. are more like waves, and they do something to it to make it look more sleek. Okay, okay. So what I love, though, is Lila being like, the key to a great makeover is that it has to be subtle. And then what does Jessica do? She dyes her hair black. <laughs> She's not interested in subtlety. She says something like, I won't be satisfied unless my like family has a heart attack when yeah. they see me. <laughs> Which is like the most peak teenager thing to say, right? Yeah. Where you're like, I, I need a reaction. And it needs to be a good one for it to be, have been a good decision. It needs to be visible. I need to feel seen. Yeah, so the feel seen. That is definitely what Jessica needs. And mm-hmm. in the modern parlance, if this book were written in 2019, in, in the 21st century, feeling seen would be the way that Jessica describes what she needs or, or what she's hoping to get. And she does get it. Mm-hmm. But I, the book does have this amazing reveal of Jessica's transformation that describes the black hair, but apparently the contrast compared to her usual hair color actually does as much work as the makeup is doing because in contrast to her her black hair now her skin looks much paler Mm -hmm. and she has to stop going uh, out in the sun to get a tan because she's trying to cultivate a pale look Mm -hmm. it makes her eyes look bluer than she's ever seen them which i don't even know that wakefield's eyes could get bluer but apparently (laughs) There's always a new level of Wakefield blue in Sweet Valley. And it sounds so bad. Like, the, the idea of Jessica dyeing her hair black sounds terrible to me. I don't know what you think. Um, as somebody that has been aggressively blonde for most of my life, you know, I was always uh, a little bit of a hair rebel and wanted to do different things to it. So I very vividly remember being in high school, and I think it was for a Halloween costume. I tried to dye my hair black, and I hated it so much because I instead of looking ethereal I looked like the undead like my skin was very like gray toned as a result and I just looked terrible and so I immediately jumped into the shower to wash it out and so like for me reading Jessica doing this there was that part of me the teenage part of me that was like no don't do it don't do it (laughs) and I felt that way too because it seems like so drastic. I mean, Lila says that the hair dye will wash out in two washes. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure how long this book takes, but I don't think that Jessica is washing her hair very often. And, but even though, I mean, I was nervous, but everybody, aside from a few re- initial reactions of like, oh my God, what have you done? Like verbatim, that's what they say. <laughs> Jessica, what have you done? Apparently everybody thinks she looks amazing. She looks like such hot shit. Yeah, and I am also deeply invested in the description of fashion in Mm. this book in particular. So Jessica uh, kind of cons Lila into helping her with this transformation, not just in the makeover aspect, but in loaning her some of these new clothes that she was so jealous of that her dad just brought back from Paris. And so I think like her debut outfit is, I I have it again highlighted, was... Jessica was wearing one of the more casual outfits, a purple jumpsuit and lizard boots. (laughs) I 
I didn't even notice that. Like, that's the more casual outfit. <laughs> it's a purple jo- But that also feels like very 80s, and yet also I could see some kid in high school wearing that and being really, today, and being just like really impressed with their style choices. Well, how perfect that you read this book today, because you've been teaching this course about fashion in film, Mm -hmm. and didn't you say that you were just on the 80s? Yeah, so I am adjuncting at FITM, uh, Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising here in Los Angeles, and I'm teaching a graduate level course on the history of film with an eye on costume design, and we just did the 80s, and of all things, we screened Heathers today in class, so then when I came home and finished the book... I was feeling some kind of vibe between like the icon of teenager identity and like how so much of that, at least my perception of it, really does come from this 80s space of teen movies that like then developed and evolved into 90s and early 2000s teen movies that I grew up with. And they, they just kind of, it all feels similar, even when the narratives and the stories are completely different. You know, the mm-hmm. fashion in Heather's is also very intense and color coded. Yeah. And and so I was feeling that pretty heavily from the new Jessica as well. They describe her, her early on in a pencil skirt that's like very long and she can't really walk in it because it's too tight around the ankles, but she looks great. Yeah. And she's wearing really high heels and people are like, are you walking in those heels? And she's like, oh, don't you understand that fashion is all about elegance is all about height yeah like true beauty is about how tall you are anyway i mean jessica's trajectory in this book it can i mean that pretty much covers it up until Mm -hmm. the very end is it like jessica is devoted to looking like hot shit and (laughs) she is super devoted to it she wants to be different she's so excited about setting herself apart and there the book makes it very clear to us that she is not just about her a surface level change. She wants to be different inside, which I think is a little bit weird because Jessica and Elizabeth were already very different inside. Mm-hmm. It's just the outside that that people were having trouble with. Um, you know, you don't have to say more than a couple words to know that who you're talking to if you didn't already figure it out by body language or clothes. And I think that's one of the biggest hangups for Elizabeth in this novel is she's feeling while Jessica's going through this big transformation and feeling so fancy, Elizabeth is just devastated. She has an identity crisis, doesn't she? Well, this creates one for her because she's like, wait a minute, I like being a twin. And I think that we are different. And I think it's pretty obvious that we're different. You know, and so she she even like writes that in her diary at one point, you know, like, I don't understand why Jessica feels this way. Yeah. Because I've always felt like it was really easy to tell us apart. Like, does she, like, her rejection of the things that make us similar makes me feel like she's rejecting me. Right. And this book has a lot of Elizabeth writing in her diary, in her Mm -hmm. journal, um, which is like a composition notebook. Yeah. And it has a lot of her thinking to herself that this, she has lost us. Like, the us of Jessica and Elizabeth is Mm. gone. And that's made worse by the fact that Jessica... So in addition to the physical change, we alluded to the personality change, but let's explain. She's putting on a fake accent, Mm. which I heard in my head kind of Catherine Hepburn, like (laughs) mid-Atlantic, but but may also be vaguely Eastern European sounding. I... She she at one point calls it, uh, she... Her British accent. Yeah. And so I just think of my own guilty habits of occasionally trying to fall into a terrible British accent and being like, oh, no, don't do that. (laughs) Well, at one point in the book, she says the word actually, and she thinks to herself, actually, that's a word that I'm going to have to start saying more often. And then she starts her next sentence, actually. (laughs) Um, So that was how I heard it in my head. Um, I, I also highlighted that. When she says it, because now we hear that today and think of actually as being shorthand for mansplaining. Yeah, and like so, a well, to well actually someone well is actually. like a verb, yeah. And so I was like, well, is she like femsplaining? Is that what <laughs> she's doing? <laughs> Possibly. Uh, she also um, starts reading like a French magazine. Mm-hmm. But it's funny because the book will on the one hand have her putting on this whole show and then it will have, will get inside her head as she's like delighting in how everybody's eating it up and thinking of like, she's just said, oh, everyone has to keep up with news in France. Like, don't you read French magazines? Mm-hmm. And then she walks away and thinks like, 
oh, who could who could care less about what's happening in France? But they're eating it out of my hand, mm-hmm. and or she goes to see a, a foreign film and uh, raves to Lila about it, but then acknowledges in her inner monologue that she couldn't read anything. Oh, I have screen. a passage. I have a passage about that. And this passage starts with her. First of all, she's at a cafe that I, I have to really hand it to this particular ghostwriter for um, amping up the the name game in terms of the okay. names of business. Cause we've got Lytton and Brown and there is a cafe in Sweet Valley now, apparently called L'Autre Chose. And so Jessica well. goes to L'Autre Shows and drinks coffee that um, she hates, mm-hmm. but she's and she looks off into the distance. And um, Lila thinks that she is has an eye problem because of her faraway look. Um, and she hasn't been she's been skipping cheerleading practice because mm-hmm. cheerleading is childish now. So that's the setup to this particular passage. Jessica felt that everything that had been part of her old identity ought to be completely buried. Cheerleading, sorority meetings, school dances, long afternoons at the beach. All of those things seemed incredibly childish now. For one thing, Jessica didn't want to be in the sun very much now that she was trying so hard to cultivate a pale, ethereal look. The sun was bad for one's skin anyway, and cheerleading just seemed ridiculous. Wearing those costumes was so tacky. Jessica was spending as much time as possible developing her new, sophisticated image. She had even gone to see a foreign film the other evening and had raved about it to Lila, never admitting that she hadn't been able to read half the subtitles because she was sitting so far back. So, oh, she's also trying to lose three pounds yes. or five pounds or something, and she isn't eating. I wanted to bring that up for two reasons. One, because like I think the last time I was on, even when we were reading Playing With Fire together, we talked about body shaming in these books, and I know that's been like a recurring theme as oh, yeah. well. Like that doesn't just disappear and reappear. It um, was a big part of the last book we read, actually. I'm sure because it's just like part of the this identity crisis, as it, to use another buzzword. But like she does <laughs> really harp on the idea, um, particularly if you think about the 80s and 90s and the aesthetic that was popular in fashion then like this passage is pretty accurate where she says the fashion models in vogue were gaunt and jessica had pledged to live on yogurt and carrots until she lost at least five pounds and so it really does go to show you know like media representation and how that affects people yeah it says mouthful it is yeah and she that that's something she keeps saying but then i also pop culture brain turned on and i keep hearing Regina George saying, I want to lose five pounds, you know, <laughs> and, and that the Caltine bars and everything that happens yeah. in Mean Girls. And so this felt very much like a Mean Girls moment and, you know, like the relationship across time there. Yeah. Uh, and particularly when later on in the, in the book, when Jessica is like, I'm hungry. And she just goes and gets French fries and ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, I do. I think that in a way that counteracts, you know, I get nervous sometimes around putting myself back in history and thinking about what these books were like injecting into the minds of young girls. But I feel like I say this in every episode now. So Gladiator, sorry if you're uh, tired of my soapboxing. But I mean, why are you even listening to this podcast if you don't want to, <laughs> if you don't want to hear my feminist uh, political uh you know, retrospect lens soapboxing. But I, I do appreciate that the book doesn't just do the weight loss thing and also puts us inside Jessica's head to show us how hungry she is and also show her, show us sh- the way that she is deciding, like, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and eat this burger. Although she does kind of binge a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so. it's, it's still not perfect. But, you know, the fact that she's just like, I'm hungry, and the first thing she goes for is fries and ice cream. It's like relatable content, pers- personally. <laughs> Give me some fries and ice cream. I so it's it's kind of all over the place with Jessica, and that's how I've always felt about Jessica too. Like I, they, she does so many things that frustrate the living daylights out of my adult self. But then there's the part of me that was once also a teenage girl that I'm like, oh. I feel for her on some level. (laughs) And so that's always the struggle reading this from my current perspective, you know, is that push and pull. And there are so many moments where, regardless of whether it's Liz or Jess, where I'm just like, you're both acting so strange. (laughs) Yeah. 
Well, perhaps it's time for us to discuss Elizabeth's strangeness in this book, which brought me much pain because of how very, very irrational it was. Mm. Uh, We talked about her writing in her journal. Mm -hmm. I don't think that her level of upset about Jessica's transformation is so strange, largely because Jessica's also talking to Liz a lot less. Mm -hmm. So it's like she's lost. She has kind of like lost this big piece of herself that I understand. She's spending a lot of time writing in her journal about it. That I understand. Mm -hmm. But there is a big misunderstanding that Elizabeth gets herself into. And it is entirely of her own making. And it surrounds her brand new beau, Jeffrey French, who I'm trying really hard to have a change of heart about. (laughs) Um, And realizing more and more that his main flaw in my mind has always been that he's not Todd Wilkins. And he is okay in this book what any thoughts on on jeffrey french it's your first impression of him uh well i don't really have strong feelings about him <laughs> the whole time for both of them i wanted to just shake the pair of them and be like if you would just speak to one another yeah we wouldn't be in this situation <laughs> well that is like the subtext of this entire podcast (laughs) so it's only appropriate that it should rear its ugly head um in this episode in this book uh so jeffrey we said early on how jeffrey mistakes jessica for elizabeth and is horrified by Mm -hmm. it elizabeth is not a party to this she doesn't see it happen she doesn't find out that it happened jeffrey though expresses to elizabeth a certain amount of glee that they look different Um, Elizabeth hasn't told Jeffrey how upset she is about this. She's only told Enid. And she doesn't get a chance to tell Jeffrey because, and before she can tell him how she feels, he starts saying how he really likes Jessica's new look and he likes the fact that he can tell them apart now. Mm -hmm. And there's a very minor subplot where Jessica decides that she doesn't want to go with the family to this... uh, frankly adorable sounding little like what is it it's like a carnival it's called like the ramsey fair or yeah something. okay it's a fair it's a fair and you know jessica in her new super mature and elegant guys says oh i don't have time for that kind of kid stuff anymore and this kind of breaks elizabeth's heart she was gonna invite uh her new beau and when she communicates this to jeffrey he seems annoyed (laughs) but at this point elizabeth has already had the idea in her head that the reason like boy jeffrey's awfully complimentary of Mm -hmm. jessica's new look i think that it's because he prefers that look to my look before jessica looked just like me well so if he does if he likes the way the new jessica looks then he must not like the way i look and we just got into this relationship and i really feel like i love him but i dive in too fast and maybe he doesn't feel that way about me and now he likes this other look and maybe he chose the wrong twin and he's having misgivings about it and this is like elizabeth like what (laughs) it's get your shit together what like I so when when the incident that I'm referring to happens, she starts having that that same internal monologue oh of, of like, oh, so he only really wanted to go to the fair because Jessica wanted to go to the fair and he doesn't really like me. He just wants to go to the fair with her. And yeah. what, what's really happening is that he, Jeffrey's super frustrated that she's making all of her decisions based on Jessica. And the reader is not in the dark about this. Like the reader, I have cannot make it more clear. We as readers do not think that Jeffrey has the hots for Jessica. No. It is very clear that Jeffrey does not have the hots for Jessica. Jeffrey never says hubba hubba. You know, he never says like, <laughs> boy, maybe you should think about making a change like that. He never does the like meme picture of the, you know, the guy looking after the girl that's walking by. You know, mm-hmm. we could, I should probably make that version of the meme, except that it's not real. You know, like where yeah. it's like, I have, I don't know what I'm going to, how I would do it. Cause, but what, what, if Elizabeth were making this meme, she would make the boy Jeffrey and Jessica is the girl walking by Mm -hmm. and Elizabeth is the girlfriend being like, whoa, why are you looking at her? You know what meme I'm talking about? Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's, uh, got legs, that meme. So I'm sure it has a name, like bad boyfriend or something, but but I don't know what it is. But um, that's not what's happening. Jeffrey only really, he actually is pretty specific that what he likes about it is that you can tell them apart now. Yeah. 
and which is weird in its own way, but he's they've just met. He's new in town, so we'll cut him some slack. Yeah, he's he's new and feels really guilty that he made that one significant mistake early on. Yeah. So he's probably, to give him some credit, like internalizing the living daylights out of that. And I'm like, oh no. Well, and this actually happened in the other, the previous book too, only once, like not as big of a deal, mm. but he made this mistake when he first met Elizabeth actually. And he thought she was Jessica. Ah, Just so for a second. Some, some history there then. But so, you, but you know that when you're reading this, you know that he's freaking out about that. You don't think for a second, like you said, that he actually has feelings for Jessica, but then Elizabeth just yeah. goes off the deep end. Can I read this fight? Please. Because it's, it's, my head was just bursting, almost. It didn't literally burst, but. <laughs> Thanks oh, for the clarification. The, the fair, by the way, is called the Ramsbury Fair. Ramsbury, Ramsbury. Fair. Okay. Very. And it has a hayride, most significantly. I think that's the best part. Yeah. I love that there's a hayride. Okay, so Elizabeth, or Jeffrey has just told Elizabeth that he wants to go to the fair. And Elizabeth says, oh, you know what, after all, I don't think we're going to go because Jessica doesn't want to go. She says she's too grown up for it. She's not sure it'll be any fun without her. Jeffrey's mouth tightened a little. He seemed to be thinking very hard and fast about something. Fine, he said shortly. I didn't really want to go much anyway. Elizabeth stared at him. You just changed your mind because of Jessica. She said accusingly. You were perfectly willing to go until I told you what she said. Jeffrey's green eyes flashed with anger. Yeah, that's right, he said sarcastically. If Jessica can't go, then why should we go? Why shouldn't we decide everything we do on the basis of Jessica? Elizabeth felt her face burn. I'm beginning to get the picture, she said coldly. You just... Liz, Jeffrey pleaded, the sarcasm dropping from his voice. Don't you realize? I realize perfectly well, Elizabeth interrupted, that you don't really feel like going to the fair now that Jessica isn't going. She glared at him, her anger mounting. I guess there isn't really much reason for us to see a movie tonight, since Jessica has other plans. Liz, what are you talking about? Jeffrey demanded, grabbing her arm as she started to stalk off. Elizabeth felt her eyes fill with angry tears. Why don't you just ask Jessica to go out with you, she muttered. What? Why don't you just ask Jessica to go out with you, she muttered, edging away from him. I'm not going to stand here and let you make a complete fool out of me, Jeffrey exploded. If you want to break our day tonight, why don't you just come up with some kind of decent excuse, like tell me you're going to be taking a bath again or something. (laughs) I'm sorry, that's a very valid excuse. I could go on, but uh, it, that's 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 what's happening. That's like how out of nowhere Elizabeth's accusation comes. Why don't you just ask Jessica out? Why don't you go take a bath? Like that's how this <laughs> devolves. Like it's what's also really frustrating about that argument is while as a reader you understand the two very different conversations they're having, neither of them seems to have picked up on the nuance of the di- very blatantly different conversations they're having at the same time, like the fight that they're having. Because later on, as they, as you see particularly Elizabeth's uh, recap of the fight to others, like this has completely gone over her head and she can't get out of her own perspective she actually is sitting at home waiting for him to call and apologize she's she's thinks to herself she's very upset they're both (laughs) very upset about this fight and this but elizabeth is like i i'm i don't think i'll ever talk to him again and she's lost her journal oh we didn't talk about that yeah (laughs) but okay we'll get to the journal in a second (laughs) but um elizabeth is she actually thinks to herself, it, because the whole weekend has gone by and he hasn't called to apologize, he must not really be interested in me. I must be right that he's interested in Jessica. Mm-hmm. And she goes so far as to even tell Jessica, have him. Oh my God. Have at him. Because she tells Jessica, I don't think we're dating anymore when Jessica asks her. In the, oh, weren't it, you going to, it was like that night. Weren't yeah. you going to go to a movie with Jeffrey tonight? And it's, and for, it's, it's a significant conversation for multiple reasons. One, it's very clear, like Marissa said earlier, that Jessica and Elizabeth haven't been talking as much since Jess's new makeover. And so this is kind of one of the rare post makeover conversations that they have together. And Liz is in a full pout <laughs> And is telling Jessica that, no, 
we're not going out anymore. It's over. He he likes you better anyway and kind of like storms out. And Jessica says like, I that sounds crazy. I don't think that's true. He's crazy about you. Yeah. And Jessica has also seen Jeffrey's face fall when when he realized or at the beginning of the book mm-hmm. that he was talking to Jessica, not Elizabeth. But Elizabeth doesn't say take him. She says it's over and I think he likes you. And Jessica's like um that seems wrong to me, but... Yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yet. On the very next page, in the recent Super Edition episode for Malibu Summer, I think I said something about how I said, oh my God, out loud at a certain point in the book. Well, that <laughs> happened again in book 32, and I think that it may need to be a new segment, um, the, the oh my God moment. <laughs> Uh, the oh my god moment being the moment of the book when while I'm reading it, wherever I'm at, in public, in private, but always alone, I'm, I, you know, I'm reading these books solitary, you know, mm-hmm. not in a group setting. I say aloud, oh my god. <laughs> and in this case, it was Jessica that brought that on uh, because she goes to the beach disco. To, I think that's where they are. Yeah. Yeah. And they're dancing. She's, oh, Greg McGinnis, that's a boy. Uh, we don't know much about him, but I don't think he, I don't think we need to open up the boys section of the podcast just to talk about Greg McGinnis. <laughs> uh, but basically, Jessica basically decides that if Jeffrey is interested in me, like maybe I will, uh, maybe I will, I'll see if he, that's true. And on top of all this, Jessica and Lila are talking about um, Jeffrey French because Jessica had been trying to set Lila up with Jeffrey. Mm-hmm. So it's like, isn't this crazy? Like Elizabeth was with him instead of you being with him. And now they might not be together. But Lila doesn't seem interested mm-hmm. in Jeffrey. She wants to go dance with Greg. Jessica barely noticed her go. She turned her drink around and around on the table, making little wet rings on the wood. Great. Great. Class behavior. She had always thought Jeffrey was kind of cute. And if what Elizabeth said was true, if he really did have a crush on her, Jessica didn't want her sister to feel bad, but it was perfectly clear that Elizabeth was finished with Jeffrey. So maybe it wouldn't be the end of the world if Jessica tried to get to know him a little better. Oh my god, I said. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, she was crying. Elizabeth said Jeffrey and I are over, but she was weeping when she was talking about it. Yeah. She's like, it's fine. This is fine. <laughs> this is fine. This is fine. I, so, it's kind of an aside, but I've been watching uh, series five of the UK's Love Island. Okay. And so, for those of you that are not familiar with that show, it is as though the American shows The Bachelor and Survivor had a millennial party baby. <laughs> they, it's, it's. I can't, I can't stop watching it. But there's a really, I was instantly reminded of some of the, you know, behaviors in that show. Oh, no. Because it's, it's very much like a dating uh, survivor style show where you can get kicked off if you're not in a relationship. And this felt so much like some of the logic that those people go through where they're like, oh, that relationship just ended right in front of my face. Might as well go crack on with them. That's the phrase they use, crack on. <laughs> and, you know, like, might as well go talk to them and have a chat. And it's just, it's like that same instantaneous, almost like mercenary, well, it's not impossible. You yeah. never say never. You know, like, kind of like, well, I'm available and you're maybe available. And it just feels, <laughs> it feels very much like that to me. Uh, if there are any Love Island fans out there, I think you'll know what I'm talking about. But it just, it very much felt that kind of like instantaneous reality TV kind of scripted moment in mm-hmm. a way. This like, well, that's over. That storyline's over. I can, I can maybe step in now. And yeah. this is my chance at love. For sure. Well, so Jessica does go talk to Jeffrey at the lunch table like the next day. And she can tell that um, he is definitely hung up on Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And she's like, stops just shy of like really outwardly flirting with him. Can we talk about how smart and savvy of it? Like that's like a peak Jessica moment. Like normally she doesn't have that kind of like inner self reflection. (laughs) She just like walks into those moments and are like, wait, 
but you don't have feelings for me in the moment. But no, she has, she stops herself just shy and it's like, oh, I realize that they've both miscommunicated with each other. Yeah. Oh, okay. And before she like sticks her foot in it. But then she has this horrible thought that, I don't know, it seemed horrible to me. She was, she's like, oh, there was a miscommunication. There's clearly a big misunderstanding, she thinks to herself. And then she thinks of Elizabeth. What a dirty trick. And decides that she's not going to clear this up for Elizabeth. She's not going to tell Elizabeth what Jeffrey said. Now, really, this is just a plot device so that, mm-hmm. the, so that the miscommunication can continue. But come on, Jessica. Yeah, where it's like, you you had the thought... The very correct thought, very uh, emotionally intelligent thought that somebody or maybe multiple somebody's just flat out didn't communicate well here, but... You're not going to help with that. You're you're going to continue to make it bad. She's just chaotic evil. Oh, that's exactly (laughs) where she is on the D&D chart. (laughs) So... Um, just to kind of like bring things home here, we've got a few more little pieces of the puzzle. One piece is that, as I alluded to earlier, Elizabeth has lost her journal. She's been writing it in a lot. And now it's just like heartbroken. This becomes important later when it gets brought back because Mm -hmm. she's written before it gets lost. She writes a lot of her feelings about Jessica and about Mm -hmm. Jeffrey in a very polite, but honest way about how how distant she feels from her twin and how how much that hurts her Mm -hmm. something that she hasn't really been able to communicate to jessica or jessica hasn't really heard the other very important thing goes back to the modeling question Mm -hmm. which is like remember ingenue magazine remember regina morrow getting to be on the cover like jessica goes to get photos taken and finds out about this fashion show that needs models at Lytton and Brown. She's mm-hmm. told she's too short to be a, a model. Except perhaps in the juniors department. Right. So Eliz- Jessica is really excited. And actually, because she's going to be getting, if she gets the job, she'll get paid $500. But she needs photos of herself to get the job, which cost $125. Mm-hmm. She borrows, like she has her parents, like on credit from her parents, basically, of $125 with the promise to pay them back if and when she gets the job. So, I mean, the money's down the tube, whether she gets it or not. But so it's really, there's real stakes here. Jessica mm-hmm. needs the f- job. She needs the $500. And... Total sidebar, but she spent, I think, like $67 at Lynette's to get like a... Lizette's. Lizette's, yeah. Lizette's sorry. Uh, a, to get like a new outfit to keep up with this new persona that she's been pushing. Right. So she's already in debt. She put it on her mom's credit card. Yeah, because yeah. she put it on her mom's credit card and her mom calls her out on it when she, she asks get for in money. Trouble. No, she's just like, we're going to add... Her mom is basically like, we're just going to add that to the tab. <laughs> yeah. Um. So this all very quickly comes to a head when Elizabeth is with Jessica because of an elaborate reason about driving home somewhere and needing to do chores for mom or something that is invented so that they can both be there. (laughs) When Jessica meets in person with the person that's, that's running um, the fashion show, she comes out in tears to the waiting room where Jessica's sitting being told that she's very beautiful, but it's just not the look that we're looking for the man in question looks across the the room to Elizabeth and is like, that, that's the look. It's this beautiful, ironic justice of, uh, yes, poetic justice, I guess is what it is, but also irony. I feel like as a reader, you can see, you can visualize Jessica's angst and like the steam coming out of her ears (laughs) when she's told that her sister who she spent the entire novel trying to not look like is the one yeah. that this guy wants for this modeling job. And, and Elizabeth is all ready to turn it down on the spot, but the man will not take no for an answer. He says, "You, this is too important. I won't let you answer today. You have to tell me yes or no tomorrow. Like, I won't accept your answer today. So Jessica's basically like, all right, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> gonna wash this color out of my hair yeah. and fix it. Uh, and... She does. She, like, immediately goes home and, like, scrubs her face. The man doesn't even believe that they're identical twins. No. He's, like, he just, he even, st- he, like, stares at them for a second or two. And it's, like, I see the family resent. Like, it's, like, I see the, the color of the book. It's, like, you're, like, okay, I can see how they sort of look alike yeah. in the facial structure. But but he just, he's, he kind of has a, mm, no, moment. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. And he's so like, she, one of you is very beautiful. The other, I think, might be a teenage boy in a wig. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the, to, to Jessica, all she hears is that she's too stylized. She's like too... Yeah. He says something like, this this look is very popular, but it's it's too stylized for us. Mm-hmm. So they want the authentic, the the beach swept, the... Which of course you know. they do, because it's, it's like an Orange County shopping center. Yeah. It's not... <laughs> <laughs> this is not Paris Fashion Week. Right. Uh, and so immediately Jessica goes into damage control. She like scrubs the makeup off her face when she gets home. She decides she's going to get the color out of her hair and basically impersonate Elizabeth to get this job. Yeah. But Elizabeth, not knowing that the impersonation thing's going to happen right away, is just ecstatic that she's going to go back to being a twin in earnest you know also penny ayala the editor of the oracle has found elizabeth's journal under Mm -hmm. a stack of papers in the office and brings it by and jessica just takes a real quick peek which you know is bad except that what she learns from from there is how elizabeth really feels Mm. and she kind of realizes like oh yeah maybe we are really different after all, which the fact that the entire series is based upon is that these girls are incredibly different, even though they're identical twins. So Jessica just had not gotten the memo. She hadn't read any chapter twos of, uh, or chapter ones, I think it often is, of these books um, to, to learn that detail. Yeah. Well, and so then Jessica does kind of an emotional about phase two and, you know, decides that she wants to go to this fair again and she wants to reconnect with her sister and I don't think we ever see the moment when she gives the journal back. But you do get the sense that she gives this journal back oh, to for Liz. Sure, yeah. uh, and then she also, knowing even her feelings for Jeffrey French, doesn't doesn't fix that scenario either. She's just like, ah, I'm not going to say anything. So when Elizabeth gets her journal back, there is a moment that we really need to reflect on for, for a moment of our own here. Okay. Um, We get a lot of passages of the journal in this book, and one of them comes on on page 111 at the end of the book, where one of the things that Elizabeth writes in her journal is, Now that she's back to the old Jessica, I think I can honestly say that her making herself over was one of the worst things that's ever happened to me. (laughs) Um, Which... You know, if I were just an average 13-year-old girl who'd picked this book up from the bookstore, maybe I'd be like, yeah, wow. But as a um, avid reader and documenter and uh, critiquer, <laughs> is that a word? Yeah. Of these uh, tomes, I would like to say that, um, objectively speaking... <laughs> This isn't even, like, top five worst things that have ever happened to Elizabeth. She's been kidnapped. She's been in a terrible motorcycle accident. The first time she was ever on a motorcycle. She was in a coma. She came out of the coma, had a terrible personality shift. Um, Man tried to, like, force himself on her uh, in the aftermath of that. I mean, a bunch of those things are the same book. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some things. What else happened? Her <laughs> sister uh, ran away. Um, her best friend had a psychosomatic paralysis. Um, a girl she knew was also was being held ha- hostage by her aunt. Um, she, oh, what was that thing? The hostage thing. Yeah, she was like in a gunfight, basically. <laughs> but this, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to her, Marissa. Oh, her boyfriend's girlfriend died of cancer. What? Um, <laughs> her cousin Rexy died in a motorcycle accident. That's oh why she can't ride a motorcycle. Uh, oh my god. Yeah, I mean, some of those things didn't happen to her, but still. <laughs> this is like the, the moment, you know... We've been talking a lot throughout this about memes and everything, but the- oh, her boyfriend moved to Vermont. Her, 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 the love of her life. But, but Sorry. it feels it feels very much like the uh, this is a personal attack, and this is what <laughs> Elizabeth is living in this moment. Is this is a personal attack? Yeah, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> that's very honest teenage behavior. I can't yeah. deny that. I can't deny that. <laughs> it's um, just like yeah. no, no, the the coma, the hostage situation, the motorcycle accident. 
all pale in comparison to Jessica's new dark hair. Yeah. <laughs> like, excuse me? Yeah. Well, Caitlin, did you have any other things? Did we get to the end? I think we got to the end. I You asked me earlier, like, what I think of Jeffrey. Yes. And I am going to, like... Not make a final decision, but there is a, a scene towards the end where Elizabeth and Jeffrey do finally have a conversation. Mm-hmm. And I had my own, oh my God, moment. But it, was, <laughs> it wasn't it was so much an exclamatory moment as it was like a, oh no. And it, <laughs> and it, uh, it was when they're having their conversation, and I'm just going to read it, but Jeffrey grabbed her hand and squeezed it tightly. Stupid girl, he said gruffly. He made it sound like an endearment, not a reproach. Don't you know I think you're the most beautiful girl in the world? He demanded, tipping her chin up to stare into her eyes. And my immediate response to that is, (laughs) Like, I just, stupid girl. And no, it's okay, he didn't mean it. It's an endearment. Yeah, that rubbed me the wrong way too. And it's just, you know, like, it is one of those moments where... The aggressive feminist in me is like, this is not the message I want. Yeah, well, it would still be teens. another decade before garbage uh, brought the song "Stupid Girl" to the the forefront. Um, but so Elizabeth I I and feel. Jeffrey, I mean, they're deeply in love. There's a very romantic scene at the end where they're like, you know, caressing each other, and <laughs> Elizabeth, <laughs> each other's cheeks. You guys, <laughs> get your heads out of the gutter, you guys. They're caressing cheeks. Face cheeks. I was going to say, you still need to clarify that. Face cheeks, you guys, I think. <laughs> Actually, think? maybe not. <laughs> yeah, she could, She knew Jeffrey was feeling the same way, that they might be in love for the first time, is what she thinks. Mm. Uh, she just met this guy, but whatever. She could tell from the husky sound in his voice when he spoke, the way his eyes looked when they fixed on hers, the tender way his fingers felt as he caressed her cheeks. So yeah, maybe that could be butt, butt cheeks. <laughs> Depends on how but, racy you want to make this book. But there's this moment here that stood out to me where Elizabeth is thinking, um, after all the strife and confusion of the last few weeks, she felt as if she had been put under a magic spell. Only it wasn't magic. It was love, which was a million times more powerful and a million times better. Because that meant it could last forever! Exclamation point! Aww. I thought it was so sweet, actually. I mean, it's dumb. I think what I wrote, I wrote I, in addition to highlighting this, I wrote in my book, this is very silly and precious. Yeah, silly and precious is the perfect way to describe it. Because I feel like you the, the book opens with Elizabeth writing in her diary. And my initial impression of Elizabeth in that moment was that she was like a divorcee talking about her youth just because of the way she was using words and language in the diary <laughs> that I was like, what? Why? Okay. And then at the end, it, it really is, you know, she's just a teenage girl and she's in the first like flush of new love. Maybe not her first love because Todd Wilkins was a big deal, but like it's, it's new and it's loving again after a loss and mm-hmm. that's its own special kind of thing. And you, so you get this kind of wistfulness that kind of erases some of the less than pleasant parts of the, you know, stupid girl thing. Yeah. Well, that is a lovely thought to come to our conclusion on, I think. Um, so having read the second book now, do you ha- how do you weigh in on the Elizabeth versus Jessica question? <laughs> Uh, vis-a-vis you being one of the Yes, yes, yes. I remember this question. Um, I feel like my original answer was Elizabeth, I think. I should have looked this up, but I did not. Uh, But I also also pivoted and was like, nah, I'm more of an Enid. I still feel like that's valid. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Enid does a good job in this book. We didn't talk about her much, but she's just a supportive friend. Now, there's a new question we have on the docket. Do you think that the ghostwriter of this book was an Elizabeth or a Jessica? Oh, um, that's a really good question. I think the answer is almost all, this is a new question that we're starting to consider. Okay. I think that the answer is usually going to be Elizabeth. That's my hypothesis. Gladiators, prove me right or wrong. We'll see. But I think that if ever there was a book that maybe was like seeing Jessica, cause Jessica does bad things in this book, mm-hmm. but they're almost like so ridiculous that you feel like the uh, the author must have thought that they were not as bad as they are. <laughs> I wonder if this author is like 
a reluctant team Jessica kind of person, like loves to hate or hates to love. Yeah. Elizabeth is really hard to get on her side of this book. It's- yeah. And I, th- I feel like the author is enjoying that, is like reveling in that. So that's maybe why I would lean more the ghostwriter being pro Jessica, because <laughs> Jessica does have these rare moments of maturity. Yeah. In in this book that I uh are good good talking points, good spots for her. So I feel like she's getting some pretty intense redemption in a way. Yeah. And Elizabeth does admit that she's dumb, basically. Like, yeah. Elizabeth is a stupid girl <laughs> in the end. Oh, Elizabeth. Well, I hope that you will come back to have an extended conversation. We'll talk a little bit about like high school fashions, maybe. <gasps> yes. For next week. But in the meantime, um, do you have anything you want people to places people want to find you or anything like that you don't have to i mean you can always follow me on instagram if you're super curious and it's just uh caitlin e mccann and that's usually my handle on things like twitter and instagram but you know no no like explicit content at the moment but you know for giggles explicit content is coming future hey now maybe (laughs) i maybe you know like i do read a lot of romance it could it could happen excellent well thank you so much for being here caitlin uh listeners as always you can follow the podcast at sweet valley diaries on instagram at sweet valley on twitter um you could leave a five star rating on the apple podcast store that would be cool and someone in canada named himalada did the sweetest thing they sent me an email with their review of the podcast, but they live in Canada. So, so they knew that since I'm in the States, I can't see the iTunes reviews that are written in Canada. So not just like Hamlato's review, but also a screenshot of some other reviews of the show that were, it just was so, it was so sweet to see that people in Canada were not only listening to the show, but writing uh, reviews and, um, that they liked it. <laughs> so Aww. that is always nice. Uh, thanks for liking the show, you guys. Um, it's been, uh, I mean, that's like kind of the reason to do it. I, I feel like I would still make the podcast if people didn't listen, but it probably, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't, it sure doesn't hurt. Sure doesn't hurt. And if we're, if we're trying to get past book 50 to, to push past that, that uh, 50 book itch, um, I'm going to need some listeners. So <laughs> keep it up, everybody. <laughs> I don't think there's any real risk that that won't happen, but you know, I could threaten it just uh, just to get you to keep listening. The tension, the drama. It's a very Jessica move of you. <laughs> oh, <uh-oh. laughs> this podcast is changing me. <laughs> All right, everybody, uh, tune in next week. Um, let's tease. Ooh, this is going to be such a tease for next week because y- y'all are not going to have any idea what we're talking about. But uh, Caitlin, would you mind teasing uh, book number thirty three? Will Sally find a real home in Sweet Valley? Find out in Sweet Valley High number 33, starting over. What does it mean? You have to come back in the future in two weeks to, <laughs> to find out. Today's episode of Sweet Valley Diaries is sponsored in part by L'Autre Show's Cafe, located in Sweet Valley, California's Funky District. L'Autre Show's, where the coffee is black and bitter, like the heart of a European model who survives on nothing but coffee. L'Autre Show's, pretend you are le cool.